Hello and welcome to lecture 65 of my class from data to decisions. I'm Chris Mack, your professor for this course. And here we're going to continue on the subject of design for experiment and continue our discussion how to design experiments for the purpose of regression. Now, last time I showed you these six principles of regression design. Now, today we're going to go through all of these, sort of. We're not really going to talk, I'm going to introduce blocking, um, but then in the next, in a, in a following lecture, we'll go into a lot more detail on the topic of blocking because it's very interesting and very important. Here I'll go through pretty much all the other ones in a little bit more detail than we have discussed so far. The first two are the capacity, of the primary model, or the alternate model. So what does this mean? Well, sometimes we're doing exploratory work. We don't really have a model in mind. In fact, we're going to go through the exercise of model building. In this case, it's hard to design, rigorously design our regression. We might have to do a trial and error. Um, probably if we don't have a model in mind, we're just going to use something like a space filling design, evenly spreading our data points out over the range, kind of typical experimental work. But if we do have a model in mind, uh, then we can design the experiment to be more effective for that model. So in some cases, we have both a clear primary and a clear alternate model in mind. Uh, I'll give you the simple case we've already talked about. I've got one predictor variable, and I think it's going to be linear, but I want to make sure that I can handle on a, a quadratic or second order model, x squared. So what should I do? Well, if I think it's going to be linear, I might optimize for a linear design, a linear model. A design for a linear model is the dumbbell design, the optimal. Um, unfortunately, if we used a dumbbell design, we would be completely insensitive to any kind of quadratic variation. We just wouldn't see it no matter what. So I do not have capacity for the alternate model using the dumbbell design. Delta model is a quadratic model, so maybe I'll use a quadratic design. The quadratic design is very sensitive, perfectly sensitive to the quadratic model, and it's reasonably efficient for the linear model. As we saw before, only about a 20% increase in the standard error of the slope if I used a quadratic model, but in fact, excuse me, a quadratic design, but in fact needed only a linear model. So generally, if I have a clear primary and alternate model in mind, I will design for whichever of those is the most complex and then live with a slight loss of efficiency for the other one. Another principle of regression design is to sample where the variation is. For example, sometimes we know that we don't have a constant variance throughout our entire experimental space. There might be some region of experimental space where the variance is higher. The uncertainty, the errors in our process are larger. In that region, we want to increase the density of the data, uh, either by squeezing together the distance between X points in, in that design space or by adding more repeat measurements in that region. Um, in fact, we would love the number of data points in that region to be proportional uh, to the variance in that region and in that way uh, equalize the effect on our regression. Also, if we have curves, a uh, response that is nonlinearly related to the inputs on a straight line, then we want to sample more in the steep regions. Uh, you can think about evenly spacing the y values y values rather than evenly spacing the x values. Um, you, don't, you don't necessarily want y values to be exactly evenly spaced, but uh, we may not want the x values evenly spaced either. Um, if we have an exponential response, for example, we might space our x values evenly on a logarithmic scale. Another topic I've mentioned before is optimal design. Uh, in fact, we were able to derive some optimal designs for simple linear models. 
with one predictor variable. But for general multiple regression models, uh, the designs can be very complicated um, because you have lots of combinations of, of these multiple variables. An optimal design is an algorithmic um, approach, uh, the, the application of an algorithm to search the design space in order to optimize some statistical metric of interest to us. Um, we already talked about, for example, minimizing the standard error of a regression coefficient. If I have a non-optimal design, that simply means I need more data points to get the estimates with the same precision, the estimates of the parameters, the estimates of predictive values, or, or something like that. We need some estimate uh, with a certain precision, and to do that with a non-optimal design requires more data points. Now, often I have, of course, multiple predictor variables, and there can be trade-offs between a design that minimizes the parameter variance of one parameter versus a different parameter, or one that minimizes the parameter variance compared to a predicted value. So there isn't necessarily one optimal design for all possible uses of a model. There's also a major limitation to the, in the use of optimal design. That is, we have to know ahead of time what model we want to use. It's only optimal in the sense of one specific model. Also, we have to know the ranges of all the predictor variables that we're going to use because it's only optimal over certain ranges of those predictor variables. Uh, so it's optimal, but only in a somewhat limited sense. The next question is, what do you optimize? Well, here's a long list. There's a lot of things you can optimize for. Let's pick a few of these, and, and you can read the rest of these at your leisure. Uh, a optimality. A stands for average. What we're going to do here is minimize average variance of the estimates of the regression coefficients. So I take the standard error squared for each one of the coefficients. I, I sum them all together, and I try to minimize that. In other words, I'm minimizing the trace of the covariance matrix. C optimality, however, says I don't want to minimize the variance of every single regression coefficient, but rather I'm just going to pick a couple of regression coefficients, the ones that are important to me. I'll create some predetermined linear combination of those model parameters, and I'll say minimize the variance of them. Um, another example, E optimality, I'm going to minimize the, excuse me, maximize the minimum eigenvalue of the information matrix. That's uh, X transpose times X. This is the design matrix. Uh, what does that mean? Minimizing the, maximizing the minimum eigenvalue. Well, we saw before that a range of eigenvalues is a consequence of multicollinearity. So, this is essentially optimizing the design, the spread of the data, so that I minimize multicollinearity. And that might be one of my goals in the experimental design. Um, I optimality down here, minimizing the average prediction variance over the design space, that is over the range of X's predictor variables that I've used in my regression. Or V optimality, minimizing the average predictive variance over set points that I specify ahead of time. All right, so all of these things will lead to different optimal designs. Uh, and so you have to be very careful how you pick what it is you want to optimize. Let me give you some optimal design examples, very simple one. Uh, we've already talked about this first one. I have a linear and a quadratic regression model. I want to test them both out against some data. Um, and, and I have uncorrelated observations. Every observation is independent of all the others. So uh, we can show that the d-optimal design is a dumbbell design for a linear model and the quadratic design for a quadratic model, which is kind of what we might have expected. But that's only optimal under the assumption that all of our observations are uncorrelated. What if I find that there's High, high levels of correlation in my residuals. In other words, some autoregressive structure, uh, like an AR1 model, as we talked about in previous lectures. 
Well, if I have a linear or a quadratic design, a, a model rather, and I have highly correlated observations, and I need to use an autoregressive model to deal with that, well then dumbbell for the quadratic design is not optimal. In fact, the deoptimal design is, is about evenly spacing along the x values. So you can see how something like the assumption of correlation in the observations impacts what we mean by an optimal design. All right, the next topic in our design for regression is replicates and repeats. First, these two terms can be a little bit confusing. They're not, they don't mean the same thing. Well, a repeat means repeat the experiment and measure it again. All right, so we're going to duplicate some aspect of the experiment. Um, but uh, repeats mean we take some of the data in a particular experimental run and re we repeat it. We collect it again. For example, um, I have a particular data point. I repeat the experiment to generate that data point five times. And I can use those five uh, uh, measurements to independently assess the variability of my data. Um, independent, that is, from whatever model I might be using eventually get that data. Uh, sometimes we really want to know an independent assessment of that variability in the response. But repeats often don't include all of the sources and variation. For example, I might do that repeat one right after another, where I, I try to keep everything as constant as possible, except for uh, the fact that I'm repeating the experiment. Replicates, on the other hand, are, are broader. First, replicates mean repeating the experiment, but it means repeating the entire experiment. So you run the whole experiment once. Then a replicate means I run the whole experiment again at some separate time. The nice thing about a replicate is it's subject to the full variability of the whole experiment, but independently of the first time you ran the experiment. Uh, we'll see in our in a coming lecture when we talk more about blocking that we will call this a complete block. I run the entire experiment as a complete block, and then I run it again as a, as a second complete block. And replicates allow me to assess full range of variability. That can happen in our experiments. I'll give you an example of the difference between repeats and replicates. Suppose I want to test the effect of some tool setting on the quality of a manufactured part. Making something, um, I'm going to adjust the temperature of an annealing oven and see if, if changing to three different temperatures has any impact on the quality of the manufacturing part, which I can measure with some test, a strength test, let's say. Well, I may run an experiment where I measure the product three times for the three different levels. But I have some experimental error, so I want to repeat measurements. How can I do that? Well, repeats means I set the tool to some randomly selected level of those three, and then I run five products through that tool, all at that same level, measure all five of them. Then I change the tool to the next level, run five products through, measure those five. Then I change it to the last remaining third level. Uh, I run all five through and I measure those five. Obviously I've done 15 experiments, 15 measurements for this experiment rather. But those are repeats, they're not replicates. A re replicate I would set the tool to a, a level, I'd run the product, I'd measure it. I'd set the tool to the next level, run the product, measure it. I'll do that for three levels. So I'll have run all three levels and gotten three measurements made. That would be one experiment. Then I would replicate that above that experiment a total of five times. So I'd run it four more times the entire experiment over again, randomizing the order of the levels each time. Those are replicates. In each case, I have run 15 products and made 15 measurements, but they're quite different, different in the following sense, uh, in, in the impact of the uncontrolled variables on your process. Right? Suppose it takes, just as an example, suppose it takes more than a day to run these 15 products through. 
Right, suppose I can run uh, three of them in one day. Uh, so I can change the level, run it, change the level, run it, change the level, and run it, and I can get all three measured in one day. And the next day I can run three more, and the next day, et cetera. So it might take me five days to do those five replicates. If I were doing repeats, I would run three of them on one day, and then I have to wait to the next day to run the second two uh, repeats. Uh, then I'd switch the level, and I'd run three more. Um, uh, uh, run a few more, and then I'd have to go to the next day and run some more after that, et cetera, et cetera. Any variation that might be changing day to day to day would be convolved with the level that I'm changing in these repeats, but it wouldn't be convolved with the level in the replicates. Right? So replicates can handle from this, this function of blocking, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Randomization, very important concept in experimental design. I have uncontrolled, unmeasured inputs. I'm going to use randomization to turn unknown systematic errors into random errors that can average out. Um, one example we've talked about in the past has been a drift. So you're making measurements over time. And something about your process is drifting, slowly changing. Uh, if I don't do randomization, then the time series effect will be convolved with the thing that I'm systematically changing in my experiment. But if I randomize, then the time series effect is the drift that's happening. It's randomly spread out throughout all my measurements and won't systematically bias my results. As a note, if I have uncontrolled variables that I can measure, then blocking uh, is much more effective to remove that known variation than randomization is. So uh, we only use we should only use randomization for the unmeasured uncontrolled inputs. And if we have measured um, uncontrolled inputs, blocking will work better for us. So what is blocking? I'll introduce it very briefly here, and then in a subsequent lecture, we'll go into a lot more detail of what we mean by blocking. All right, so here's an example. Um, I have a certain treatment, maybe that level that I used in the oven of the previous example, and uh, I get some result X using this treatment. Then I have another result, y, that comes from a second treatment, a different treatment. And what I'm interested in is, are these two treatments different? And if so, what is their difference on the results? In other words, I want to know the difference between x and y, the difference in results. Um, if, if, if the higher temperature results in better quality than the lower temperature, then what I want to know is the change in the quality comes about because of this change in annealing temperature. As an example, one way to think about this is to take the variance of that difference. What is the variance of x minus y? Well, we can just go through the math. It says the variance of x minus y is the variance of x, the variance of y, minus 2 times the covariance of x and y. Well, if I completely randomize things in such a way that the covariance is 0, well, then um, measuring the difference between two variables has a variance equal to twice the variance of each individual variable. But if I can increase the covariance of x and y, I can, in fact, reduce the variance x minus y. So if I make this term bigger, then the variance of x minus y gets smaller. Well, what does that mean? That means if I have the same error in x and y, Errors cancel when I take the difference between x and y. Well, that's, that's a great thing. How about if we can design our experiment so that whatever variation might be happening affects x and y in the same way? That's an increase in the covariance. Well, that's what blocking will enable us to do, to try to increase the covariance of x and y. In other words, if something's going wrong, at least it will go wrong the same for both x and y, and it won't impact the difference between x and y. 
All right, we're going to talk a lot more about blocking uh, coming up soon. So let's review what we have learned so far here in Lecture 35. Can you name all six principles of designing for regression? What is optimal design? What is the difference between repeats and replicates? And finally, what is randomization used for? Well, we're we have a lot more to discuss when it comes to design of experiments. Till then.